Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back. My name is Honest M, and I am here for another P Valley Season 2, Episode 3 review for Dirty Dozen. This is the official, unofficial after show for P Valley, for the Stars P Valley series. And I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. So, this episode was Season 3. This was Dirty Dozen. Um, this was actually penned by another writer. Um, her name is, I think it's Kimmy uh, Yamiyoto. Yodo? Yodo? I don't know. I'm going to call her Kimmy or K KK. <laughs> no, I'm just giving her a name. But I will call her Kimmy. Um, I will have Kimmy be my guest on this week's podcast or whatever it was, the show. I will have Kimmy be our guest on the show um, to just talk a little bit about what is it like to be in, a, um, be in the writer's room with Katori Hall. Um, I'm very interested that she... Um, did Katori give them like some type of like series or like story bibles that they could stick to? I will be very curious, which I don't know if she could tell us this or not, but I would want to know like what was the process of like actually pinning a whole episode? Is it like they talk about it in the room and then she goes off on her own and like just do it? Like I would be very curious to know about that. And then the last thing that I would want to ask Kimmy about is because this episode really felt like it was a music video. Like there was just some time where I was just like in my living room I just jamming and I'll be honest when I first saw this episode on Sunday of last week I really didn't like it like I was just like okay this is an okay episode but then when I went back to watch it again and actually take notes I was like oh this is actually a really really good episode so um there was a lot of things that were like thrown um thrown to the audience that I really feel like was setting up for the rest of the season and so I would just love to talk to Kimmy about that uh, off the tangent of P Valley, I would love to just ask her a little bit about her background and how she got into TV writing. So that's what I would have for Kimmy, um, who will be our, you know, will be our writer guest on the show. And then for our acting guest or our cast, or I guess our staff, I don't know what to call it. I guess behind the scenes and then for our on-screen talent, I would have Brandy Evans, aka Miss Mercedes. I would have her come on the show um, because I feel like this was really a Mercedes episode, even though it was Dirty Dozen and they were down on a tour. It was really like we got to dig deep into Mercedes. We get to know more about her backstory. Um, we get to, you know, figure out who her baby daddy is, you know, how that relationship started. Um, and then just also see this very honest conversation with her and Terika towards the end of the episode. So those are the two guests that I would have on in this, on this, 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 blah. that is the guest that I would have on to, for this episode. Um, let's go ahead and get right on into it. So the plot of this episode, I feel like was actually very, um, the, the plot of this episode was kind of highlighted during the opening scene. Um, also I'm going to get to our themes, but like the music was like a very, very big point of this episode. So I would love to ask Kimmy, like, did she actually put in the, the, the certain songs that she want, or is that something that's kind of done later in the editing process? So that's just something I'm curious for myself. Um, because this episode just really felt like a like a extended music video um and so our theme of this episode that we kind of got clean um like clued into is where the dollars at where the dollars at where the dollars at take it with the hood classic where the dollars at also like for once when i was about to get ready to start recording like i just kept age number 332 i kept hearing what would people do for money hey Hey, 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 what would you do for money? And that's what I feel like this episode is all about. What would you do for money? Uh, we get to see that in the opening scene. You know, Roulette is doing a lot of stuff for money. Um, I feel like when we start, when we get to talk to Uncle Clifford and, um, and autumn like we get to see that you know selling the pink is not off of the menu and so it's like again what would you do also there was just honestly sorry guys uh in in the opening scene besides that where the dollars at roulette said a line that said i will break a rule for a bag and i feel like that's what this whole episode is about what would you do for a bag would you break rules from a bag? Would you lose your integrity for a bag? Like, it was just so interesting that she said that in the opening and then it seemed like every single thing was all about, you know, what would you do for a bag? And that's even down to the fry, uh, that's even down for like Andre and them um, running for governor. I mean, running for mayor. And he's doing this because, I mean, ultimately for the bag. Like, anyways, we'll get there. I'm getting ahead. So let's go ahead and get into our themes of this episode. Uh, so that's the plot. The plot of this episode is what would you do for money? Period. What would you do for money? 
Um, the themes of this episode is everybody is a hoe for something. Music plus the power of the pole. I kind of put those together because the music was just so... Like I told you, like it was like... It felt like a music video. So the music plus the power of the pole is a theme. Um, and then drugs. So the themes of this episode is everybody is a hoe for something. Music plus the power of the pole and drugs. Going into everybody is a hoe for something. Clearly, we open this scenes up with roulette. Opening... I mean... Um, yeah roulette she's on this literally swinging on this amazing pole and we see that she will break some rules from a bag and she's literally hoeing which is actually one of uncle clifford rules and so it'll be interested to see how all of that is going to come back to bite her because we also knew that in the um later on in the in the episode when you know the girls were like doing lap dances the guys was looking for the girl who gave great hit so that is going to get back to uncle clifford we can go ahead and bookmark that the next thing Mercedes will coach like that's a very obvious thing I think Mercedes realizing that these new girls are here her shoulder is not getting any better and honestly you know she don't really know when her gym is going to be up and running and so it's kind of getting her to realize that you know maybe I should be, get some sponsorships maybe I should be open to this possibility um with having coach sponsor me and then she also was like I, I like how she was like I'm not gonna just do this I want you to make sure that your wife is involved and so that goes right on along with this theme. Like I told you guys in the beginning, with well, Uncle Clifford talking to Mercedes about, um, I mean, not Mercedes, Uncle Clifford talking to Haley about selling the pink and like who, you know, it, it started off with this conversation being about, you know, who fought it is that, you know, Mercedes is not going to be, you know, up and running. And he was like, well, it's 15% my fault, 85. And then, you know, they kept doing negotiations and we realized that they're really negotiating the ownership fee for what will happen if the pink will sell. And we know that autumn set price is 10 million. Um, so, and the reason why I said this is everybody is a hoe for something is because I never thought that Uncle Clifford would like even think about this possibility of selling the pink. But I realized that, I think he's realizing that you know, Autumn is a smart girl. She knows what she's talking about. And like, if they could sell the pink for $10 million, 3.5 million is life changing money. And so I think he's just realizing like, you know, he, I, I know, I feel like he opened the pink with, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, this is for the community. It's a revolving door. Like the girl's going to come and go, but I really think he's looking at like Keyshawn and Little Murder and then the pandemic happened and he's really starting to ask himself, like, I'm 40. Like, what's my game plan? What do I I want to see for my future and I think 10 million or 3.5 million sound like a hell of a you know a future and so I feel like Uncle Clifford is even willing to hold himself out just a little bit you know to secure his future and so that's why I put that in that theme also I wanted to highlight this uh I was recently this shout out to my YouTube algorithm I was recently listening to this interview with um Haley or Autumn I keep calling her all types of names um, and her 811, but I was, she was on that interview and she was talking about how last season, I felt like she was on my show. <laughs> last season, she was like hiding herself. And so we really didn't get to see Autumn, but then she explained it like this season, she's being her full self. She's in boss mode. And so she would be able to just be a little bit more aggressive. And I was just like, okay, that makes sense because I guess I, I don't know like I, I guess I was still thinking like you know this is not your club but I guess like if you just literally just save this club from the brink of extension you put your own money down yeah you would have some ownership yeah you would be a little bossy and you wouldn't be afraid to speak your mind and you know to speak your knowledge especially when you know what you're talking about and so I wanted to kind of backtrack on my previous statement about Autumn and being kind of confused about her character um, because after I listened to that interview, it made sense. Like, you know, she's not, she's not hiding anymore. She's not running from anything. Um, but she's really, you know, she's an owner of the pink and, um, she's, um, she's the owner of the pink and she hasn't, she's, she's not only just the owner in like money and value, but she's actually been really trying to keep this thing afloat. And so it would make sense that she would just be a little bit more assertive, even though I was like, it was a bit much, but when she explained it that way, it made sense. The last thing um, for this theme of everybody is a hope for something is the pastor annual fried chicken dinner. <laughs> now, y'all know I do not like Patrice, but thank God for Patrice in this scene because um, this is a scene where um, 
the the white boy who's trying to become mayor he comes over to the pastor uh dinner and he's pretty much just trying to get the pastors to get on board with him and like pretty much backing him backing um backing his mayor you know his his candidate for mayor candidacy for mayor and like just pretty much telling the pastors to like get the congregations all on the all on board and if you notice that um maybe i do have his name Duh, let's see what's his name <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh yeah, Wayne Kyle. So one of the brothers that's now he about to be uh um yeah, Wayne is running for mayor, right? And so when he was talking to the pastor, uh, oh yeah, Pastor uh, RJ, when he's talking to Pastor RJ, and he was like, well, I have no problem with telling my congregation to make sure that they vote behind you. And he was like, oh, well, if you do that, you may just find your collection plate just a little bit more, you know, just a little heavier. And so that was just like a cute little exchange before, of course, Patrice came in and fucked it up. But that was just a cute little exchange in a way to illustrate that this is actually what happened. Um, I don't know if you are aware, but everything that happens in the church is not, you know, all of the 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 messaging that happens in the church and from the pulpit is not is from it is not from the goodness of the pastor's heart and it was crazy that that was illustrated in the show when I was I'm recently reading this book called Untamed by Gwendolyn Dole and I'm like shout out to this white lady because she said something I literally just read this and so when I was about to do this uh, when I, I I read this chapter and I was like look at this white lady like like she really giving me some information so when i read this chapter and then i saw this on the show i was like i felt like this is the perfect time to like put this here um so let me just read this really quickly this is from again uh gwendolyn doe untamed decals they decided to focus on abortion before then a full six years after the Roe versus wade supreme court decision the prevailing angelic position was that life began with the breath excuse me the prevailing angelic position was that life began with the baby's first breath at birth most angelical leaders had been indifferent to the court's decisions in row and some were cited as supporting the ruling not anymore they wrote a new memo using freshly freeing freshly fresh outrage and rhetorical calling for a holy war to lead the nation back to the moral stance that made america great they sponsor a meeting of 15,000 pastors called the Religious Roundtable to train pastors on how to convince their congregations to vote for anti-choice, anti-gay candidates. This is how they disseminated the memo down to the angelic ministers who passed it down to the pews across America. The memo read, to be aligned with Jesus, to have family values, to be moral, one must be against abortion and gay people and vote for the candidate that is anti-abortion and anti-gay. Presidential candidate Ronald Reagan, who was a governor of California, had signed, had signed into law one of the most liberal abortion laws in the country, began using the language from the new memo, angelic threw with their weight behind him the angelicals threw their weight behind them and voted in a block for the first time to elect president Ra president reagan the religious right was born the face of the movement was pro-life and pro-value stance of millions but the blood running through the movement veins was the racism and greed of a few this is how white angelicals became the most powerful and influential voting blocks in the united states and the fuel of the American white supremacy regime. Angel number 1048. So I read this to tell you that this is not a new memo. Like this has been going on for years and years and years. And we know we have all been in church where all of a sudden some, some candidate is coming into the church and, you know, talking to us about voting and all of that stuff. And I just, I love that Katori highlighted this, like showing you that everything that's being taught in church is not being told 
from the goodness of their heart. Also, this talks about white angelicals. I went to Hampton University and I know for a fact that they used to have this annual pastors, you know, pastors weekend and where they used to have all of these pastors come here and I bet you it's the exact same thing. And so I, I'm just going to, I'm saying this because for one, <laughs> uh, I have been, I've, I've been raised in a church and since I was a child, I always had like some type of apprehension against Christianity. Like they were saying, you can't listen to hip hop and you can't do this. And so it was like, I just, I was like, I just, just don't feel right to me. And so as I grew older, I started to question my, my religion. I started to question where all this stuff is coming from. And, you know, Christianity was gave, given to us through slavery. And so I'm not trying to put a holy war against the church, but I just have to, you just have to ask yourself, like, are these churches really for the communities? Are these churches really trying to help move us forward? Or are they supporting some agenda? A lot of these pastors are saying shit because they're putting, it's putting money in their pockets, not because they're trying to help for the greater good of the world or for black people at all in the communities. A lot of these mega churches being fucked up communities. You don't see them trying to do anything to change it. No, they just put the money in their pocket. And so I love that Katori put this and not even just Katori, Katori and Kimmy put this in this show because it goes to show you that, you know, everything in the church ain't glitter and gold. Like these people are human at the end of the day. They are, they may act like they're representative of God, but they are flesh and blood just like you and me. And so I think that we need to realize that everybody's a hope for something. And we need to start questioning the information and the messaging that is being spit at, that is being given to us from the pulpit. I don't know about you, but I just feel like the the the, the church, especially the black church, it has been nothing but divisive. It has been, it's just like this, anti-gay, anti, like it has, it has not been trying to keep our community together. Instead, it's been trying to shame people at the same time using their talents to run their, to run their, you know, to run their choirs and to run their gospel ministries. But then you want to shame their life choices is in the same breath so i just i personally don't fuck with the church <laughs> so i'm just so happy that they highlighted this scene to show you how a lot of y'all pastors are you will be surprised to know that they are not so you know pro-black they are pro-green and they're doing stuff and they're saying things because they want to put more money in their own pockets not for the betterment of the community so i'm gonna get off my high horse but I don't fuck with the church. So, music and the power of the pole. I told y'all that music was such a big theme in this episode when we first started. We had where the dollars at. Then we get to go in. The Dirty Dozen tour is starting. Um, and then we get to see Murder. Got his new um, video, Champagne Campaign. Like, that bitch was rocking. Like, I was literally in my room like, Champagne, Champagne, Champagne. Like they was popping, okay? Um, and so like, we see they got this video, like murder, 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 murder. Like, anyways. Champagne kept Kane. Keyshawn is fucking it up on these tours, you know, selling out the tour of Miss Mississippi. I love WAP. Like, he's killing it. Um, next thing is the music and the power of the pole. Uncle Clifford, um, because Mercedes is out, we have Whisper and Roulette taking the main stage. And Uncle uh, Clifford is the one who set him up, which is so funny because I was actually shocked when he started, like, pole dancing. But then I went on Katori, like, Twitter, and she like, nobody should be shocked that uh, Uncle Clifford came on the pole. I'm like, you are absolutely right. <laughs> he turned over 18, 18. Like, of course Uncle Clifford know how to pole dance. And so um, I just thought that, first of all, Uncle Clifford fucked it up. Like, I was like... First, he's like, but well, she she is a full figure girl, and she got her ass up on that pole and was pushing it around and dropped it. I don't know, was like, bitch, I know that's right. And so they go into there and then whisper and roulette like they, I mean, y'all, like I was literally like I thought roulette was just I have never seen some of them dances like when she had her leg in the pole and she was like like popping in the air. I said. And then when they was doing the one thing and Katori has it on her page where she did like a page from the, from, um, she did a, uh, from the, uh, page to the screen and like was showing how like they was doing all these movements and then they locked arms and it was just a beautiful episode. Like I just, I was mesmerized. Like I just, the song choices and the, the music, like it just really was just, it was a good ass episode. Like I, I can't say that enough. And so that was a mu amazing part. Um, 
going back to this whisper oh i guess i'll get to that later um mercedes you know she's finally she decided to take coach up on her offer on his offer coach said that he was gonna have his wife there just come on down she goes there she sees this beautiful you know penthouse it's champagne there it's a pole in the living room um she gets to meet his wife before coach get there um the wife is just a little um off stand like a little um standoffish but i love how like mercedes didn't allow that to like you know get to her like i feel like mercedes is used to people judging her just based off of her job and like her appearance and so i feel like she you know it did for a minute shake her but she quickly brushed it off and then when they had like when they were sitting on the couch and like you know she started talking about the pictures and she pretty much checked coach like nigga you need to recognize talent and i think that's when farrah was like okay like maybe because i think because like Farrah said, this was her first time. And I think Farrah was kind of looking at it like, oh, she doesn't know who this woman is. Like, she may think like this woman's trying to come in and take her position. But I think by Mercedes just saying Mercedes and being true to herself, she realized like, oh, like she's just literally here to do a job and here to get her money, to get her money up. And she's doing it with integrity. Um, and so they had that conversation like, and what if you would have said no? She's like, I would have respected your no, ho. And so, um they have this conversation and you see they're all like you know farah she's starting to calm down and relax and then coach she gets super excited of talking about the mercedes experience and so then mercedes not you know being shy and i know her shoulders was hurting her because i was nervous because i'm like girl i thought she was in pain like how are you up here doing all these moves but anyway so she goes and she's doing these pose tricks and pretty much like Farah is fucking mesmerized. Farah is looking at her like this bitch is amazing. And so when Mercedes go, and, you know, she go off the pole and she go give it to Coach. And like Farah is like, I want some too. So that is the power of the pole. I think. I think you you think about. I I, I guess even me. I, I have been changing. This this show is like changing my mind about everything. Like you think about dancers and you just think that they're just some hoes and they're not like they're intelligent they're athletic like and they can do shit that i can't do and so it's like you just really are learning how to see them as people and not just their occupation which we should have never just been looking at them like their occupation like it's kind of ridiculous but that was the power of the pole the pole just completely changed fair of mind and fair was like i want to eat some coochie tonight <laughs> last thing drugs 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 was a very big theme in this episode roulette and whisper in the bathroom um i don't know about y'all but two things let's bookmark this i feel like i feel like whisper is somehow contact um somehow whisper is involved with my tavius like i just something about like her whole little thing about i was lost in the wind my plans up in um, and then I came here like I just feel like we need to keep our own whisper because I don't trust her I mean also I don't trust roulette like it's like where the fuck and it's like Mercedes actually said this Um in the first episode she's like we don't know where these girls are coming from and i'm just really starting to question like Why is roulette going so hard like she's making a shit ton of money on the floor at the pink But then she still feels like she needs to you know make this extra money on the side by hoeing and so I just feel like I feel like Whisper is connected to Montavious and Roulette is running from some shit. So, like, let's just keep our eye on them, too. But Roulette gave Whisper the drugs in the bathroom. And I was just like, uh, I feel like they got to be on one of off the Clipper rules. <laughs> like, I just feel like no doing coke in the bathroom got to be somewhere on off the Clipper rules. Um, next thing, we had the older stripper. Now, y'all may have not picked up on this, but so there was a scene where pretty much, like, uh, Whisper, Roulette, they fucking it up. Um and like they show like a uh, big bone like she just in a um she in a dj booth got her leg up popping and all this stuff people throwing cash at her and it was two of the two of the older stripper i want to say jupiter and in brazil maybe um they were off to the side watching her like this bitch didn't leveled up like like mario brothers and they was like if she don't be careful she may find something in her drink so Okay, yeah, we know that we heard we've heard about strippers putting stuff in drinks. Sorry, Cardi, don't want to call you out, but yes, we've heard about it, and so I just think we need to bookmark that because I think that if Big Bone keep like being who she been and like saying fuck these rules and you know maneuvering her way through, like I think that you know she may end up with something in her drink and they may steal some money from her. Next, uh, Shelly, Shelly, which is Terica, uh, mama. 
uh, in the beginning of this episode, we saw that Terika had went up to uh, Pastor Patrice. She, you know, she's been giving out these food boxes. Terika pulls up all crazy, um, and she asks us for two boxes of food. And she tells the lady that she's getting it for her her neighbor. Uh, when when the lady, you know, the volunteer had ended up calling the pastor over because she's like, oh my gosh, she gave me a Bible verse and blah, blah, blah. And Pastor Patrice was like, yeah, you lying. But she ended up giving her four boxes. And so that was cluing us in that something was going on with Terrica. Terrica's on the phone calling Mercedes, asking about, you know, when they about to start back up practicing and all this other stuff. So it was just like showing us that clearly something is going on with Terrica and Shelly. And then we find out when uh, Mercedes get interrupted with Coach and Fear and them that, you know, she was driving Shell home drunk. And Shell has been pretty much off the wagon and it's because she doesn't have any uh she's not working anymore and so she's been drinking a lot more and honestly um a lot that's happened to a lot of people in COVID like people you know you at home you ain't got shit to do so people have been drinking uh, I know that was me I actually had to look up and I'm like girl you are I, I've never been like a big wine person but then I'm like keeping wine in my house because I have to have a glass every night and so Again, Katori and Kimmy and a whole writer room continuing to show those elements of COVID without like being like COVID, COVID, COVID. Also, it's like I always honestly, you know, being that we just went through COVID, whenever I hear that a show is going to address COVID head on, I'm always like, bitch, <laughs> you know, like I don't want to know. I don't want to fucking see a damn TV show with us on the screen and all like I want to you know I wish I like the insecure route like let's act like it didn't even happen but I love how Katori is doing it because again it's like it's highlighting how this major thing that happened in all of our lives how it's affecting us and for a lot of people they're not working anymore they're uh, they're not able to provide for their families and so they just drinking themselves into a coma so I really love how she did that um, and then the last thing, also from that episode, with, I mean, from that whole thing with Shelly, we found out that Mercedes lied. Uh, she said that, you know, she was older than 15 and then she ended up getting pregnant because she wanted to grow up fast. And honestly, I, I, I can attest to that. Like I, when I was younger, I used to lie about my age all the time. And like one time, this is how my karma is so fucking immediate. One time I had met this guy and like, you know, he was, you know, from the basketball court because it was in the neighborhoods and he was just like so fine and he was tall and like, you know, just, it was like my little first puppy love or whatever. And he was just like so respectful. He came over to our house, we had dinner. And I remember it was like, me and him was dating for a while and he was about to come to like my dance recital because I was like dancing in school. Not like dance recital, but like our dance workshop or whatever. And like when my, my dad had called my mom and was like, you got this grown ass motherfucker with my daughter and come to find out this nigga was lying to me about his age. And like it ended up turning out like he was like, I don't, I don't even, I think he's like 20 something. And like I was only like maybe 14, 15 at the time. And so like, you know, that was just like, uh, uh. And so like from that happening in my life, I learned to never lie about my age. Like, cause I used to do it all the time. But like when that happened and somebody lied to me about my age and you know, I got my little feelings hurt. I remember, um, cause my mom was like, you know, you can't see him no more. And you know, me being me, I like, cause I wanted to know, I wanted to talk to him and I had called his phone and his mom was like, do not call this phone no more. You are too young for him. Blah, blah, blah. Like, like just like shut it down. And so like, I got my little heart crushed, but it definitely taught me a lesson about not lying about your age. And again, I'm a, I'm happy that because Tori is not being afraid to talk about these taboo topics because you know, a lot of times we always put a lot of stuff on men, but as women, you know, sometimes we can do things not in our best interest or we can do things being slick and we're trying to grow up and then we get ourselves in a situation that we really are not prepared for. So that was amazing. And then the last thing that I wanted to pinpoint and I was going to put as one of our themes, um, the, the mayor campaign. That, I feel like that's setting it up for the season. Like, because we started off with, you know, Patricia and them at the chicken dinner. And then when she, when he ended up shutting down her club, I think that means that Patricia's going to run for mayor. And then now we know that, remember, oh my God, I almost forgot to talk about Andre. And so Andre was having dinner with the other, the other cow brother, the black white one. 
and they were just you know drinking talking shit and he talking about oh because Haley sent him the, the the text about how much they would sell for the pink and he was like do you think that they were really the promised land will really spend 10 million dollars for the pink and he was like i mean yeah you know and so he was like, she may be, you know, Haley may fuck around and be the most powerful person in Chuck Elisa. And he's like, more powerful than your brother. And then, you know, they get on this joking and Andre talks about, you know, potentially running for mayor. And he was like, you can't do that. You ain't got no, you ain't got no, um, you not from here. You ain't got no church backing you, blah, blah, blah. And he did, when he did that Tidal impression, I said, Andre. Andre must have heard me talking shit about the brick too. It was like, bitch, put some respect on my name because when he did that, the first man, Chakalisa, I was like, is that Tidy L? Like, he killed that impression. And so we see, like, it's setting it up all these players for this mayor campaign. I mean, this mayoral uh, run. And so I think that that's going to be, like, a big thing throughout the rest of the season. Um, I just want to go really, really quickly, make sure I didn't miss anything. I did have a theme about the Winks because I uh, I do want to bookmark that I think somebody's going to die at the end of the season. Um maybe big t may die or you know big t may die and then little murder end up getting shot and then i think that's how him and uncle oh wait i'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> i'm getting ahead of myself i'm getting some predictions so let me be quiet um but yeah those are the themes of the episode everybody is a hope for something um the mayor campaign i think that's just something coming but i did want to point out um andre and the white black boy talking uh pastor you know him uh, I mean, not Pastor Wayne. Mayor Wayne trying to go at Pastor Patrice. That's not going to work. She's going to end up running for uh, mayor. Um, and then, don't forget, Uncle Clifford always talked about him putting his hat in the ring. So, even though I don't think he would do it, especially if right now he's thinking about selling a pink. So, that was that. The power of the pole, music, drugs, and that's it. Let's go ahead and move into our key takeaways. Angel number 3135. Our key takeaways of this episode is that it's okay to pivot. I think that, you know, with Uncle Clifford, um, I never, I, I don't think before season one, before the COVID, will he ever think about, you know, selling the pink. But I think because the COVID has happened, because he had had time away from the pink, because he is seeing how Keyshawn is moving on, Little Murder is moving on, Mercedes is about to be moving on. I think it's making him realize, along with him recently turning 40, I think all of these combined it make, is making him realize that, you know what, like what, what is my life after the pink? What is my game plan? And so I think this is a bigger story for all of us to realize that, you know, COVID, though it happened and like we want to move beyond it, I really feel like we, if you, if you allow COVID to happen to you and you didn't do anything differently afterwards or I just, I, if, you, if COVID didn't change you, I don't think you did COVID right. I think COVID was brought to us divinely and spiritually for us all to have this moment of pause, to all have this moment away from the daily grind and to really think about what's happening in our lives. And so if you find yourself in a position where, you know, coming back from COVID, you find that you don't like doing the same things or like you want to do something different, don't be, a pay, don't be afraid to pivot. Like that's what this happened for. Your whole life is just a journey to get you to the direction of your dream. So don't think that, oh, it's too late or I should be doing, no, 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 no. If you should have did it, you would have did it. And so the fact that you're even thinking about making this pivot now, you should go ahead and go in the direction of your dreams, just like Uncle Clipper. Like I'm sure he never thought about it, but now he's willing to do it. The next thing that this, this episode taught us is the church the power of the church and like we need to be questioning is the church for our good is the church helping the black community or is it hurting the black community i think we really have to like start um questioning where we given all of our power and all our allegiances our allegiances to i think for a lot of us you know christianity was given to us like your religion is pretty much given to you from your parents and i think until you if you don't ever question it like you just keep living that way and you know like even though you feel discontentment inside, you will keep doing it because this is what you're supposed to do. But again, life is all about questioning and exploring and growing. And so if you find that your church is no longer 
in resonance with you or you don't like what they're teaching listen to your body listen to the information that you are that is telling yourself um another part in this book that i didn't even get to and the whole reason why she even talked about that was because she was having a you know a spiritual conflict where she asked her pastor you know she was in disagreement with a message that he said and he pretty much told her like don't think about it like you just have to trust god and that's not god god will never tell you to deny the information that you have on the inside because god is on the inside and so I think that, you know, as a community, we really have to start, you know, second guessing and trusting all these people that we give our money and we give our, you know, our power to. I think a lot of people are against the, you know, against religion because they say religion is for the sheep. And in a way, I can't help but deny that. I mean, I can't help but to agree because. I was always taught, I spent my whole life in the church that, you know, faith without works is dead, faith without works is dead, like, but I wasn't realizing that, oh, it's, it's literally like, I have to do the action, I have to walk in the direction of my dreams, and then God will give it to me, I was thinking that, oh, because I'm a good person, because I'm going to church, because I love God, because I respect my parents, and because I'm begging God for something, that he's just going to bring it in my life, and that's not how it works, like, you can beg and beg and beg all you want, but until you actually start walking in the direction of your dreams, you're not going to actually realize it, and so that is my beef against the church, my beef against the church is because they don't, they don't tell you that the power is in you we are all gods we all have this information inside of us but they take that out because if you believe that you're a god and if you believe that the information that you have on the inside would you really go to a church to have a man tell you something differently no you wouldn't so i think as a community we really need to trust the we really need to question these churches and i'm not saying that all churches are bad i still listen to tg jakes all the time like i really I, I listen to Sarah Jakes. Like I really, I um, there was a pastor in Virginia that I used to go to his church. I really love pastors who speak the Bible and actually teach you how to use those those print those actual principles in your life. Where they talked about trauma, they talked about limiting beliefs, like they talked about actual faith and actions. Like if your church is doing all those things, if you feel like your church is teaching you how to be an actual good person or how to actually apply these principles, then. I don't have anything against it. Keep doing your thing. But if you feel like your church is just literally making you feel bad, making you question your life every single day, then you need to make a, ask yourself the bigger question on if this place is even in alignment with who we're trying to be. Okay? All right. Last, last segment. Dear Katori. Oh, hi, mama. <laughs> hey, Katori. Katori, can I just tell you, like, I just feel like... Even though I don't know you, like, I've been watching, like, a lot of your interviews and, like, your energy. Like, it's just something, I feel such a kindred spirit to you. So, again, just thank you for creating this beautiful, beautiful show. Um, thank you for allowing Kimmy to have this time to shine and, you know, be able to pin this episode. Um, I really want you to know that this episode was a 9 out of 10 for me because of, again, the pacing. The storytelling this episode really felt like a music video. Um, it really felt like you can't, you know, you couldn't just sit and watch it. Like I felt engaged. I felt like I needed to like kind of talk back to the screen. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like um, things like that. Um, only reason why I'm not giving it a 10 is because I just feel like there's still so many amazing things to come. And so I'm like, I'll just give this a 9 out of 10 this episode. Um, I want to thank you for not being afraid to tell complex stories, not to be able to tell those taboo things of, you know, the pastors, the pastors, you know, aligning with political parties, uh, women lying about their age, women doing sex work to survive. Like, I, I, I am so grateful that you're bringing these complex and tab taboo stories to the screen because not, once we come, this is the problem with our community. We know all these stories, you know, the homosexual, the, the download brothers, we know all of these stories, right? But we try to act like they're not there. So when we do that, we can't heal. But by you revealing these in their authentic, you revealing these stories in their authenticity and like really showing these characters as full, really like, you know, fully realized beings, we can see that story. We can see the truth of it. And then we can learn from it. And then we can move forward. Then we can ask those questions of, hey, like our, is our church for the, you know, is the church, is the black church for the good of the black community is the black church helping the black community you know is it helping the black community by us shunning and us um feeling like you know gay or or, or male masculinity or male male um 
homosexuality can only be viewed through this one lens like is that helping our community is it helping our community by judging you know strippers and sex workers by their profession or should we try to understand what will get them in that predicament i think by you putting these stories on the screen it's allowing us to be able to see ourselves in the full you know in the fullity of ourselves with the complexity and then we can heal then we can move forward then we can make better decisions because i think i look at that story of like little murder and like you know, he's literally like in love with this person, but then on the, in the same breath, he like, you know, defending like, oh, oh, what you know, what you asking me about this nigga vote? You know, so it's like, to me, it's like, it has to feel so shitty to have to hide who you really are. And like, how many men are being that? How many men are hiding their self? And so... I don't know, it just made me want to have more empathy just for, you know, the male, especially home, especially for black men that are, who, who are not feminine gay men. Like, it just makes me like, damn, like, how, how are you able to have a relationship? Are you even able to have a relationship? Or is it because you feel like I look this way, I am this way, love is off the table for me. So this is just really opened me up to all these things. And, I, and I'm sure that they are, you know, starting to have those conversations with themselves and being like, you know seeing the reality of it and being like that's fucked up because like maybe there may have been a dude that treated you know treated some some woman or some you know dude in his life like how little murder treated uncle clifford and made him realize like oh like that wasn't cool i shouldn't you know so it's just like i just thank you for being willing to tap into these taboo areas and tell these stories in the best way possible and then the last thing i want to tell you is where the tour at like, we're the tour, girl. Like, I mean, because come on, like, if Marvel can have fucking roller coasters and action figures, I know I should be able to go on the Dirty Tours, Dirty Dozen tour. So you already got the strippers. You are you already know how to run plays. So just tell, I mean, I can come down there and help. If you need me to just, if you need me to just be you, if you need a second shoe, I can come down and I can help. But I just really feel in my heart and my soul, we need a tour. We need the Dirty Dozen tour. I'm going to come to Atlanta. I'm going to buy the plane ticket. I'm going to buy the hotel room. And I'm going to purchase a ticket to go to the Dirty Dozen tour. I want to see this live. I think this, this will be amazing to just like really, you know, show. You can show the strip. You can highlight the dancers. Um, you can uh, even bring Little Murder out there to do some video, you know, like to say his songs or not. Or it could just be literally just like a 10 city, you know, highlighting the best of the best dancers and I'm going to pay for it. And I'm going to buy it and I know a whole bunch of other people need art as well. So where the tour at? We need the tour. <laughs> we need the tour. Okay. All right, y'all. That is it. Angel number 4141. That is all I have for P Valley season two, episode three. The dirty does it. Miss Mississippi. Let me go ahead and go into these predictions, y'all. Let's go into these predictions so we can wrap this on up. My very first prediction is those note cards. Them bitches gonna come back to bite them. I don't know what's gonna happen. Remember, I was telling y'all that whole thing about uh, uh, Uncle Mer, um, um, Uncle Clifford getting kidnapped, and I was like, that's some foreshadowing. Something gonna happen. Them postcards gonna get out, and they're gonna get out to the world. Little murder. I feel like little murder is going to end up being exposed. Remember when we saw his friend or his ex friend? They was talking. They was like, yeah, well, when these when these trade tales come out, when this mixtape trade tales come out, so like, I just feel like he's gonna end up getting exposed about him and his relationship with Uncle Clifford um that murder game i don't like it the fact that you know like all of these them, them just acting like they dying i don't like it and i feel like it's like some russian roulette and like uh katori and them fucking with us being like which character gonna die and i'm not feeling it like i my biggest prediction is that you know big t is gonna die and little murder gonna get shot in the process and by little murder getting shot and his life kind of being in danger that is gonna make uncle clifford she's gonna come back into his life and realize like life is too short and then they're gonna get back together so that's my big big prediction um and i think i have one more one more 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 uh my very last one um is i feel like roulette you know roulette did the wink with old boy when they was you know selling them drugs her holding her doing drug all, keep her eye on that stream whisper i don't trust them bitches like they're up to something and i really 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 feel like um roulette is you know 
something i don't trust her like she's gonna end up getting off of clifford in trouble i think like the hoeing or like all of that's gonna end up getting out and i think that's gonna end up putting the pink in trouble and like maybe the mixed boy the wayne you know the wayne brother like maybe he may use that information to like leverage the the bio of the pink. I don't know. But I don't trust Roulette. I think her and her hoeing ways is going to get us all in trouble. Um, I do feel like maybe towards the end of the season, we will see Terika and Mercedes all in one house. Um, and... Oh, and Miss M Mississippi, her and Little Murder, her having way too much fun on that tour. And, like, I just feel like Derek is going to pop up on one of them tours and shit is going to go down. So... Those are all my predictions. What are your predictions? What were your key takeaways? What were some of your themes of the episode? Maybe I missed them. Go ahead, put it down in the description box below so we can start a so we can start a dialogue. Until we meet again, dream those dreams. Never let the internet rush you and never ever ever let someone tell you what you cannot do. I will see you next week for the next episode. Mwah.